Good evening, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to Beyond the Guidelines, as tonight we talk about the management of localized HER2-negative breast cancer. We have a great uh, faculty tonight, and uh, we're going to talk to them about taking care of patients and also the data that supports our current uh, treatment uh, practices. In preparation for this meeting, I actually met with uh, six other investigators in breast cancer, and they'll be appearing uh, here uh, by video. I wanted to get some ideas over the last couple of weeks about some of the things that we could talk about. We will be uh, reviewing some uh, off-label indications. We're really going to focus on risks and benefits of the therapies that we're talking about uh, here today, but uh, note that. And this is actually the second of three meetings we're doing. Last night, we were in here talking about ER-positive metastatic uh, disease. And tomorrow night, we'll be uh, talking about a great topic, her too low breast cancer. Uh, we're then heading out on Friday to the uh, ASH meeting. We'll be doing four programs there. If you want to check it out online, or if you have any colleagues in the uh, San Antonio area, uh, we'll be starting out early in the morning and finishing late at night with uh, myeloma and uh, lymphoma and CLL all day uh, this uh, coming uh, Friday. And then uh, we're going to be, uh, we're located in the Miami area. We're going to be having a weekend of a general medical oncology uh, with the uh, Florida cancer specialist uh, so, uh, as well. We'll be spending the entire uh, weekend um, talking about uh, oncology. We have, we'll have more than 25 clinical investigators there. That's next March. For the clinicians here in the room and the iPads, you'll have all the slides from the presenters. Also, uh, if you have any questions or cases you'd like to run by us, you can use the iPad to do that and also to complete the evaluation. For our many uh, online attendees, and last night we had more than 500 people online, first of all, welcome, and all the functions uh, will be in the chat room uh, that we just uh, described. We will be uh, video recording all these sessions, and we'll let you know by email when they're posted and, and are ready for uh, people to consume who are, were not able to make it here tonight. So we're really excited. There's already been a lot of great stuff presented here at the San Antonio meeting, a lot of it from the people here on the podium uh, that we're going to be talking about. Uh, here's where we're heading today. We're going to start out talking about genomic assays and localized ER positive or 2 negative disease. Uh, then we'll talk about ovarian function suppression and ablation in the management of uh, these patients in the adjuvant setting, CDK inhibitors in the adjuvant setting. Then we'll flip over and talk about triple negative breast cancer. We saw some really interesting data presented, including by Dr. O'Shaughnessy. And finally, we'll finish out with one of the most interesting and provocative topics, topics in all of oncology, circulating uh, tumor uh, DNA. Um, we uh, did a survey over the last couple of weeks of all the faculty that were participating uh, in this program and some others. We have 20 investigators. We're going to show you the results of that survey as we go through this. I mentioned that I spent uh, some time with some other uh, breast cancer investigators. Here they are, and they're all probably very familiar to you. Uh, we met over the last few weeks, and I recorded uh, their comments. And we, we do, you've heard of TikTok. Well, we do what we call TikTok. So you're going to see a bunch of uh, short videos, all less than 90 seconds of their comments. We're going to go back and forth between lectures and sort of making rounds uh, with these docs and see what our faculty uh, has to say. I was uh, mentioning last night that I think, well, I know that it was in the, this hotel that the attack trial was presented 20 years ago by Michael Baum. I think it might have been in this area, actually. Uh, you know, for those of you who weren't around then, as you probably know, that compared to uh, uh, anastrozole to tamoxifen, sound anastrozole is about somewhat better, but there was another arm in there too, which was a combination, and to a lot of people's surprise, that did not show any benefit. I just think it's interesting, here we are 20 years later, we're about to talk about like triplet therapy, so things have changed a little bit since the attack trial. Um, also, we, uh, last night was really fun because we had Virginia Kaklamani on, on the stage, and uh, she was telling the story how she saw this uh, press release about this hormonal triplet and was so excited about it that she said, I, we got to present that at San Antonio. And somehow she made it happen, and it's going to happen this coming, uh, this coming Friday. Uh, so, I mean, maybe they'll get it published. <laughs> Who knows? That's pretty quick work. Uh, so, Sarah, any thoughts about that in terms of where that might be headed? Of course, this is a very 
specific population. I think they uh, people who had relapsed on hormonal therapy, so you know, resistant to hormonal therapy with, uh, as Joyce calls them, shedders. So people who have uh, PIC3 in their blood. Uh, any thoughts about uh, where this might be heading, uh, Sarah? Well, first of all, kudos to the quick work of Virginia and the team to get this presented immediately. I mean, that that is. Um, uh, pretty cool, and I think these are very exciting. I wasn't part of the study, but I can tell you I can't wait to see the data. The rumor mill is they're going to be very impressive. We, are, we really have an embarrassment of riches now with the capivacertib just being approved a few weeks ago. Um, there are a lot of ongoing studies of other PI3 kinase inhibitors, and if we can get it to be tolerable, it may be the way forward using triplet therapy. I was sort of joking with the faculty that they should check out our myeloma program Friday night where standard care is quadruplet therapy up front. So I don't know if breast cancer is going to make it to that situation. But let's start getting into our content here. We're going to talk about uh, the use of genomic assays. And uh, so a couple things uh, from the survey. We presented a postmenopausal patient with a positive node and uh, with a recurrence score that was 20. The way we do consensus is we say, well, what do you do in this situation? If everybody says the same thing, we call it a consensus. If there are four different answers, well, there's a little granularity there. But we definitely saw a consensus in terms of postmenopausal women in this uh, situation. Uh, and we uh, presented this situation. Have you used uh, uh, adjuvant chemotherapy in a patient with a 21-gene recurrence score of 20? And you can see it's kind of split there. Uh, um, Joyce, uh, maybe you can comment on this question that we asked uh, also. We have a 40-year-old uh, patient who's premenopausal, 21 dream recurrence score of eight, so low, and one positive node. And uh, first of all, in terms of hormonal therapy, you can see down below, everybody says ovarian suppression plus either AI or tamoxifen. But the interesting thing is here in terms of adjuvant chemo, it's kind of split. Half the people say, well, seven people say, yeah, as actually, it's actually broken into thirds, so I guess this isn't really a consensus. So a third of the people say they wouldn't give chemo, a third say they would, and a third say they'd offer ovarian suppression as an alternative. Joyce, where are you? Um, I would, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that the standard of care for this patient in the offset trial that's being done is chemotherapy plus optimal endocrine therapy, LHH agonist, and AI. So that's the standard of care on the offset arm being randomized to OFS plus AI alone without the chemo, but the standard is chemo. Uh, but what I would do is I would look at her ERPR grade, key 67, make sure everything's concordant. And if they were concordant with the recurrent score of eight. And then if she's someone that I could really work with, we'll work together on toxicities, et cetera, I would talk to her about ovarian function suppression with probably tamoxifen to start off with, with this kind of biology, you know, do two, three years and switch over at some point. Um, I don't treat everybody with chemotherapy um, who's premenopausal with one positive node and low recurrent score. So, Laosha, uh, maybe you can take a look at this variation of this scenario with one positive node, but now with a recurrent score of 20. And now you see a shift up towards chemotherapy. Most people are saying they use chemotherapy, but four say they would offer ovarian suppression as an alternative. Any thoughts in both of these cases? So, <clears throat> I think you need to remember the results of the Rx Ponda trial. So that very clearly showed that the smaller patient subpopulation, the ER positive population, about 600 patients randomized to chemotherapy or no chemotherapy, um, the chemotherapy group benefited despite the fact that they had a low recurrence score. So obviously we wouldn't recommend chemotherapy for a postmenopausal woman with a recurrence score of 20, <clears throat> but in the premenopausal setting, patients benefited. So you could argue and you could make an argument that it's the ovarian suppression effect, but we don't know that for sure. And if you are wrong, then you might cause the death of this person. So I think it's a very legitimate scientific question, and there will be a clinical trial which will try to tease out whether it's the ovarian function suppression effect 
of the chemotherapy that contributes to the benefit, or is it the chemotherapy cytotoxic effect? But actually, I personally think that it depends on the molecular makeup of the cancer. So it's probably not either or, but it's rather for one particular person, it may be the chemotherapy that's more important. In another person, it's the ovarian suppression, depending on the molecular makeup of the cancers. So these women tend to have lower estrogen-related gene expression patterns or sensitivity signatures for endocrine therapy and higher immune presence. So you saw this beautifully, that immune presence actually is a predictor of chemotherapy sensitivity. So I think the balance of these two things might eventually determine that who benefits from the ovarian suppression and doesn't need chemotherapy and who needs the chemotherapy as well. Hal, any uh, thoughts about this? Also this paper that your group has an in interesting uh, look at your own use of uh, re uh, the recurrent score, uh, which kind of, I thought it was interesting, uh, I was talking to Dr. Tarantino about that. Can you comment a little bit on what La Lars was, uh, Larish was saying as well as uh, what you found at your own place? Well, the first thing to say is, um, in this case, I, I think the chance that chemotherapy is going to change the natural history of her disease is really, really, really low. Um, it is a great service that the Taylor X and R Expander trials have provided, and they've allowed us to avoid chemotherapy in a huge percentage of our patients, probably 60 plus percent of our patients no longer need to think about chemotherapy for ERA positive disease, which is wonderful. But there was a real design flaw in retrospect, which is they didn't factor in the impact of ovarian function suppression. And, um, you know, the difference here in, uh, in recurrence outcome, not survival, but recurrence outcome was a few percentage points favoring chemotherapy in premenopausal women. And if you imagine that even half of that was from ovarian function suppression, you're now down to a barely discernible 1% to 2% potential benefit of chemotherapy. And if you think about the side effects of chemotherapy and the rare but life-threatening side effects of chemo, I think you're probably pretty much neutral. So I would be very comfortable not giving this patient chemotherapy. I think it's part of the dialogue, but I, I think it's very reasonable to not give chemotherapy. So we lean very heavily on the recurrence score assay, as Neil was alluding to, and you know our group had sort of set up um, a, a reflex test so that if the tumor was greater than one centimeter and if there was one, two, or three nodes, we would automatically get the uh, or zero, one, two, three nodes, we would automatically get the recurrence score sent from pathology. Um, and then when we did a QA project on it, we actually found that we were frequently ordering it on particularly higher grade tumors when they were actually less than one centimeter or in women who were somewhat older than our original threshold of 65. So we reported on that experience mostly just to make the point that our clinical faculty were telling us that actually perhaps even more utility or a wider breadth of uh, interest in testing than um, uh, than had been um, anticipated. And I think the takeaway from that, and it speaks to the utility of this test, which was presented at this meeting in 2005, uh, as I recall in the first retrospective uh, analysis, is that it's a really useful assay. And it, you know, it allows you to look the patient in the eye and say with a lot of confidence that they either really do need chemotherapy or they really don't need chemotherapy. So Neil can always find the little chink in the armor, the Achilles heel of any clinical problem, and find, oh, you know, what if they were 39 years old and had an oncotype score of 24 with 17 positive lymph nodes, they still need chemo. But those are exceptional cases. And for most patients, it's immensely clarifying. I was surprised that you were kind of hesitant about ordering an archetype in a 65-year-old woman. I mean, it implies that you may, when maybe 65-year-old women wouldn't be interested in the chemo. You know, we're going to talk on Friday in Ash, you know, they're giving CAR-T to 85, 88-year-old people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, really. <laughs> um, you guys don't give chemo to people over 65? Well, again, everybody should look at their own institutional data. When we actually look at women who have ER-positive grade one or two strongly ER positive, PR positive cancers who are 65 and older, darn few of them get chemotherapy. So um, it's a, you know, obviously we all can imagine a patient who would meet that criteria, but it's not unheard of, it's simply uncommon. All right, let's bring in our auxiliary faculty and kind of enlarge the discussion. And uh, Matt, I'll be curious what your thoughts are about uh, Dr. Sharma's comment. She actually told me something I wasn't aware of, which is you can't do an archetype in a, on a node, so I'm going to be curious if you can explain that. But that's how this conversation started. Mammogram, ultrasound, MRI, none of them find a primary in the breast. So she gets appropriate surgery, and now we have cancer in the lymph node. She's postmenopausal, so, you know, it's only two lymph nodes. So I would have liked to use a genomic test to determine whether I should prescribe or recommend chemotherapy for her or not, but we can't do it on a lymph node. 
So that, I guess, brings up the issue of using genomic assays in patients who are node positive. Based on our expander in patients who are postmenopausal and have N1 disease, I'm using Oncotype to determine if they would need chemotherapy if the score is under 25. We go with anti-hormone therapy plus an adjuvant CDK if they fit the criteria for Monarch E. For patients who are premenopausal, you know, as we're all aware from our expander, the benefit was noted in patients who had a score of under 25. And for those patients, the default right now is to recommend chemotherapy, although a large NCTN clinical trial was just activated a couple of months ago that's going to look at this question in premenopausal patients with N1 disease and low oncotype. I think the motivation to avoid chemotherapy for this subgroup is quite high, both within patients and the clinicians treating these patients. Matt, any thoughts? And maybe to start out with, what is the reason you can't do an archetype on a node? Well, we were just uh, discussing that uh, earlier, and <clears throat> a couple points. First of all is that the, uh, the assay, of course, was developed in breast cancer tissue. Um, and so those, t uh, you know, 16 genes and, and, and the five, uh, uh, you know, the control genes really are related to breast cancer tissue. So the issue comes up in that, um, Lyos just mentioned, which is uh, very important, and that is that, you know, some of these genes, including uh, genes such as BCL2, are, 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 have a differential expression, higher expression in lymphoid tissue. So the problem is, is that <clears throat> we don't know what, you know, an oncotype DX means um, you know, in uh, uh, lymph nodes. By the way, we also see this issue as well. It's one of the, probably one of the things I see occasionally where, you know, we have a smaller tumor and someone macro dissects out DCIS. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes you can get a, <clears throat> excuse me, a, <clears throat> a high recurrence score from a high grade DCIS and, and you're fooled. Uh, but it, the reality is we have to make sure that we're actually uh, getting that genomic assay from the the, uh, in this case, the ER positive invasive cancer. So, uh, Sarah, I'd like you to take a look at this uh, next uh, video. First of all, uh, here's a, a study that's actually going to look at uh, ovarian, you know, the question we were just talking about. Uh, do you need to use uh, chemotherapy as opposed to just uh, ovarian function suppression? Any comments, uh, Sarah, about the study? I thought the randomization is kind of interesting. It's ovarian suppression plus or minus chemo. Any thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. It's exactly what I think many of us wished the R expander had included um, was uh, this. So I think it's a really important uh, clinical trial that's going to fill in our gaps in knowledge relating to this very important question. All right. So uh, here are three comments. You know, we, as I mentioned, <coughs> we kind of like ask people what they do. And sometimes you learn some interesting things. And one of the things I was curious about, you know, we saw a great presentation uh, at ASCO on a, uh, ovarian suppression and ablation, and we're actually Hal's going to talk about that next. And I was curious about like, what the bar is, because I know that there are some patients who just get tamoxifen, and there are others who get ovarian suppression and ablation plus either tamoxifen or AI. And I was curious, like, what the bar is or what are people actually doing? And I learned something kind of interesting that, I mean, you can correct me if you see it in the guidelines, but I'm not sure that I do see it in the guidelines. But when I started asking people, what I learned was actually oncotype was an important factor in the decision about tamoxifen versus ovarian suppression. And I, I remember showing a video of you, Sarah, actually with three other investigators all kind of saying that you took oncotype into account mm -hmm. in deciding whether or not to do ovarian suppression, obviously in a node negative patient. So I asked this group the same question. Here's what they said. Stage one low oncotype patients are ones where I still feel very comfortable giving five years of tamoxifen. In a premenopausal woman, a node negative tumor that is maybe smaller than two to three centimeters and doesn't have a high oncotype DX, and I can do fine with, let's say, a slightly less effective endocrine treatment. That's when I would utilize tamoxifen. Premenopausal patient with node negative T1 or T2 breast cancer and an oncotype DX score of under 11, I feel pretty comfortable in tamoxifen and not escalating to AI because we've seen in Taylor Rx that these patients have an extremely excellent seven-year outcome. And majority of those patients who were premenopausal got tamoxifen there. Um, clearly, in patients 
who have a higher score and have needed chemotherapy, my motivation to then talk about ovarian function suppression if they're still premenopausal after chemotherapy is higher because of the higher risk. Ovarian function suppression is not an easy thing to tolerate, uh, especially for our younger patients. Their bodies, minds, reproductive organs are not ready for it. So it does require a lot of supportive care to get the patients through that intervention. Some patients are just not ready for ovarian function suppression. So an easing in approach for certain patients works better. Sir, any comments? We'll talk about the issue of ovarian suppression in the next module, but in terms of genomic assays and trying to figure out how to treat, I mean, when you give tamoxifen, as Dr. Tarantino was saying, it is a slightly less, of, you know, the hazard ratio is not quite as good, right, as AI plus tamoxifen, but the idea is what the absolute benefit is not worth putting a patient through that quality life-wise, maybe even more. One of the things we haven't really discussed is what we're talking about what we'd recommend for a patient, but then we have to consider what is the patient going to be able to adhere to for the full course of therapy. I agree with Hal on that one patient with node positive oncotype recurrence score of 20. I'd be comfortable saying no chemo, ovarian suppression, AI. My concern is after a year, the patient would say, I'm done, my life is miserable, and now we've lost that opportunity to potentially have the benefit from the chemotherapy. So I think probably what you're hearing from them is they're using Oncotype as well as the T-score, the N-score, and the patient's age to sort of have a gestalt um, about the likelihood of benefit and are looking at the tolerability and adherence. Uh, Joyce, anything you want to add to that? And um, I'm curious how you manage these patients. Um, I think that we have to also, I agree with the recurrent score under 11. Um, I'm sort of at the T1, you know, smaller T2, but age is important. If they're under 35, they do very poorly with tamoxifen alone. And they really didn't look at 40 as a cutoff. So to me, 40 is the cutoff. I really think that the patients, those young women need um, LHRH agonist. Uh, so, but older gals, or over 40, I, I too am comfortable with the um, tamoxifen for five years based on the Taylor X. They, those patients did really well. Interesting. So uh, one other question in terms of uh, genomic assays, Hal, that I'm curious about. Do you ever use it in the neoadjuvant setting? We did another survey. Uh, we didn't put that in here, but where we saw a fair number of investigators, up to maybe half, use it in some situations. Do you ever do that at Dana-Farber? We can. So Harry Baer did a beautiful study with the NSABP a while ago where they actually stratified patients for neoadjuvant treatment based on the recurrence score. And if it was very low, then they were offered endocrine therapy. And if it was in between, there was a randomization to chemo or endocrine therapy. And if it was more than, I think it was 30 in the original iteration, they got chemotherapy alone. So the interesting thing was that in the middle group, chemotherapy was a little bit more active in terms of uh, initiating a response. But in the end, it had the exact same rate of conversion to breast conservation surgery and the exact same outcomes. I must admit, if the patient's going to need chemo, we um, usually just give them chemo in the neoadjuvant setting. We tend to reserve neoadjuvant endocrine therapy for women who have reasons why you're not giving them chemo. So they're older, they have other health problems, and you can use that treatment. If you do use it, I think the other key message is you need to use it neoadjuvant endocrine therapy for a long time. Even six months is not probably sufficient to get to the optimal response. You're probably talking about closer to a year. And um, even then, it's rare in our experience that you see patients who have more extensive disease or clinically palpable nodes at baseline convert to avoiding the surgery you'd originally anticipated for them. In terms of your group there, are there situations where you use genomic assays other than Ocotype? No. Interesting. Okay, so Matt, let's talk about the data. Thanks, Neil. So you talk about uh, genomic assays in uh, localized ER positive HER2 negative breast cancer. So you can see the outline here. We're going to start by just focusing on <clears throat> some of the updated long-term recurrence and survival data from Taylor RX. Uh, <clears throat> we're all familiar with these data. These were the data originally published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And these, of course, changed our practice. You can see there on the, on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, overall, there was no benefit of chemotherapy uh, in uh, patients with the recurrence score 11 to 25. These are the patients, of course, that were randomized. So we could uh, say fairly confidently that endocrine therapy was non-inferior to chemoendocrine therapy. 
uh, and Joe Sperano published this again uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2018. But the wrinkle that we've all been talking about is this, and that is that there seems to be this effect of age uh, recurrence score, and then and more we're understanding the role of clinical risk. And what you can see there on the right-hand side is that this initial observation is that in age less than 50, uh, you saw this uh, benefit, um, a, a, especially in the higher recurrence score patients. So you can see there on the <clears throat> recurrence score 21 to 25, uh, there was actually a delta of 6.5%. And this was curious because in the postmenopausal group, there was no evidence that as you went up on the recurrence score that somehow you gained uh, you know, more benefit from chemotherapy. So for example, if you're a 65-year-old patient who had a no, uh, excuse me, a no negative tumor with a recurrence score of 24, there was no greater benefit than he had a recurrence score, let's say, of 12. So this was an interesting observation. Uh, and then, of course, uh, this uh, adding to this was a, a follow-up publication uh, which was, of course, uh, made a lot of sense to us, and that is to, uh, to bring in clinical risk. And so we know, of course, that, um, that someone with a re recurrent score of 24 with a, uh, you know, a, a six millimeter tumor, that obviously that patient, that's a quite different scenario than, than somebody that, say, that had a, a 2.5 centimeter tumor. And so what you can see here is exactly this. Um, and you're looking at the, uh, on the bottom, you're looking at recurrent score 16 to 20 and those with 21 to 25. And you can see here, there's just larger benefit, uh, delta benefit in those patients that have higher clinical risk. Um, and so this is something that, that I guess intuitively makes sense, but we needed to see this to add it to, you know, to what we were already doing with the recurrent score. Um, so uh, 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 Dr. Sprauna did prevent, uh, provide an updated analysis of TaylorX at this meeting actually last year. Um, and that updated uh, analysis now uh, demonstrated uh, with a much longer median follow-up. Now I think we're out over... Uh, nine years, you can see again. There's absolutely no improvement uh, in uh, in invasive disease-free survival, distant relapse-free interval, etc. Overall survival with the addition of chemotherapy uh, to endocrine therapy. So this is again very encouraging. The question is always, you know, well, with longer follow-up, will we see a difference? We're not seeing that. But again, what you can see again is uh, this difference that continues to persist. Um, as it relates to the age factor. And you can see here that uh, <clears throat> what uh, Dr. Sperano presented again is that in those patients with a recurrence score of 16 to 20 or 21 to 25, you begin to see this benefit of chemotherapy. What was helpful here for us to see was, again, breaking this out by clinical risk. And you can see if someone with a recurrence score of 16 to 20 with a low clinical risk, uh, there was really no benefit of chemotherapy. Uh, but again, as you were to uh, contrast that with a patient with a recurrence score 21 to 25, with a high clinical risk, now all of a sudden you're seeing this large benefit. So this is really helpful when we're seeing patients in clinic, and I agree with Hal. Same thing at our institution, we, we use the recurrence score, uh, and these are information, it's just very helpful to have a straightforward conversation with patients in terms of decision making. So uh, what about, uh, 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 you know, so here's the summary that I just mentioned. This interaction between age and menopausal status continues, uh, 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 or interaction between age uh, and outcomes uh, continues to uh, uh, persist. No benefit in uh, postmenopausal women, but in age less than 50, we see these effects, again, larger in higher clinical risk. So what about the long-term outcome of the uh, RX Ponder? Well, <clears throat> uh, we're still waiting for the longest term, but we did have an update of RX Ponder, uh, and this was actually presented uh, in 2021. Um, and uh, these data, um, there was a, um, uh, in, in, and I'll just again go back over the, the, uh, the study in a little bit detail, but uh, like Taylor OX, this particular study <laughs> looked at the role of chemotherapy in patients with one to three positive lymph nodes. Uh, and again, this particular study, a little bit different. It allowed randomization uh, with a recurrence score of uh, zero to 25. Uh, as opposed to Taylor Rx, which started that randomization with that intermediate score of 11 to 25. And what you can see here again is that in postmenopausal patients, uh, no benefit of chemotherapy. Uh, but, uh, and again, as I pointed out earlier, that regardless of recurrence score, 0 to 13 or 14 to 25. But again, what you see in premenopausal patients is you, you see a, a small benefit of chemotherapy, uh, both in the recurrence score of 0 to 13 as well as 14 to 25. As many people have pointed out, 
Uh, this trial was designed in an era where patients were receiving tamoxifen as monotherapy. That was actually the majority of patients. So there was very few patients that were receiving ovarian function suppression, and essentially no patients who were receiving, let's say, ovarian function suppression plus an AI. So um, uh, uh, there, this uh, analysis that uh, uh, that was really, I think, a lot of people asked for was this, and that was, well, well, gee, if you actually look at those patients that received ovarian function suppression, might you see a difference in terms of the arms. And the reality is, is that <clears throat> there was very few patients that received ovarian function suppression. You can see in the endocrine arm, it was at most 14%, and uh, 15, 14, 15%, and the chemotherapy on uh, much lower. So I think what we can say, and, and what the, this group tried to do in this situation, I say tried, uh, I think that this was the right thing to do, was to look at this issue of IDFS by OFS or not in premenopausal patients. And this is in the endocrine treatment arm in these premenopausal patients. Uh, they did not see a difference in, uh, <clears throat> in IDFS uh, in this landmark analysis. But I think what we can take from this, of course, is that um, we do need uh, a prospective study to, to, to sort this out. Just briefly, I'm going to just mention, um, you know, something has been seen uh, in the MINDAC trial, something quite similar. This is the 70, or the, uh, the mammoprint assay. And essentially, in those patients, that are low risk by mammogram print, you see this difference in the benefit of chemotherapy uh, in those uh, patients according to age. So we're seeing something very similar. Um, <clears throat> so with that in mind, I think um, we can say here that the RX Ponder data, similar to TLRX, no benefit in postmenopausal women. We see this benefit in uh, eight patients aged less than 50. The, the problem, is, as Hal has mentioned, the predominant hormonal therapy that was used was tamoxifen without OFS. And now what we're going to do is really begin, and we've talked about this already, we're going to look at this prospectively. <clears throat> this is run by Terry Mamounis along with the NRG. This is going to be, an, uh, this is the intergroup trial. This is activated. A very important study that's going to uh, hopefully be able to answer this question. What is the role of chemotherapy uh, in patients with uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 a recurrent score of of uh, 16 to 20, high clinical risk, 21 to 25, uh, that are node negative, or those that are node positive with recurrence score of 0 to 25. So I just want to stop. I'm over time, but I just want to mention one thing real quick. And, and this was a provocative um, uh, a paper that was presented by Shireen Loy and, and the SOFT group, uh, looking at the uh, evaluation of PAM50 intrinsic subtypes. And you heard earlier to, uh, today uh, <clears throat> from Joyce that says, well, if you have a, a person that aged less than 35, those patients are just different. We've got to give them chemotherapy. This is the first time I think we really saw granular data about this issue of uh, what makes uh, the, the, uh, the cancer in a young woman different than, let's say, a cancer in a 45-year-old. 40, uh, and what they did is they looked at very young, less than 40, versus uh, greater than or equal 40. And what you can see is that uh, if you look at PAM50 ROR categories, this is a, really a different uh, distribution. You see a, a, a higher percentage of patients that have a high uh, ROR scores in the very young patients. Um, if you look at this, uh, this, of course, is prognostic. We've shown that, that this has been shown in the past. But interestingly, uh, even in, uh, uh, if you look at uh, those patients that are considered luminal A, they still have a little bit worse outcome in the young, in the young patients. This is now looking at PAM50. Again, the same thing. And you can see on the right-hand side, luminal A tumors doing worse in patients less than age 40 versus greater than 40. So I think what this tells us, it, it provides even more, uh, I think, importance to the fact that we do need to uh, enroll patients under the study. There is probably a subset of patients, and Laos said this earlier, of very young women who have a different biology of cancer. Clearly, ovarian function suppression is going to be an improvement for these pa patients, I think, uh, but there, there may be a role for chemotherapy, and we're looking forward to uh, enrolling patients on NRG BR009, a very important study. Thank you. So we're going to move on now and talk about more about ovarian function suppression and how it's going to review the data. But here are some findings uh, from our survey, kind of demonstrating what I was saying, which is you can see if you present a low recurrence. Now, we've put age 40, maybe we put age 35. <coughs> you might have seen something differently. But uh, at least in age 40, you see recurrence score 8. Nobody gives chemo. Interestingly, it's kind of split between whether they use ovarian suppression or not. But then um, everybody, well, almost everybody gives chemo. The current score is uh, 20. A uh, quarter of people don't. And you can see the type of hormonal therapy uh, that's utilized. 
Uh, one other thing, and I'm, I'm just kind of curious, uh, whether Matt, what your thoughts are about how you approach uh, patients who wish to retain fertility. Uh, we asked, you know, when people use uh, LHRH agonist uh, in a patient who would like to retain the ovarian function. It was a little bit split between whether it's, so we were saying in a situation, maybe thinking ahead, chemo, neoadjuvant chemo, maybe Pembro at some point, that's going to happen. Uh, but uh, in this situation, um, people were kind of split between whether they started with treatment or prior to it. How do you approach in general this issue, uh, uh, Matt, of uh, using an LHRH agonist uh, during a chemotherapy or before it? So uh, a couple things about this, you know, I think the data are clearly are emerging that initiation of a GNRH agonist, um, you know, prior to uh, a, a chemotherapy um, does uh, 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 certainly increase the rate of uh, resumption of menses. Uh, there's some controversy about does it actually improve uh, uh, the, the rates of pregnancy, but I think what we, what we now have is enough data that really does suggest that initiation of these medications during uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy can clearly um, um, uh, increase the, the, the chance that you're going to have resumption of menses, and in some data sets, probably higher rates of, of pregnancy. I think the question here is, well, should you initiate it, um, let's say, uh, um, you know, a week before or right with? You know, I think most of the data that have been generated have done it, you know, at least a week before. So that's how I would do it in this situation, is to try to get it on board before that uh, first dose of chemotherapy. So, uh, Joyce, I'll be curious uh, your thoughts about Dr. Mizell's uh, approach to using ovarian function suppression, and also maybe some of the clinical pearls you have about trying to get people through ovarian suppression. Here's Dr. Mycel. My feeling on the ovarian suppression during chemo is that it probably isn't going to hurt much, and it may help, and that tends to be the reproductive endocrinologist approach as well. We usually will start the ovarian suppression about a week before the chemotherapy, continue it through the chemo, and then for some patients, that's actually a nice segue into having ovarian suppression continue on into starting endocrine therapy. For others, you know, especially those who are triple negative or HER2 positive, we don't need to continue that. But I do have a low threshold to do that if patients are interested in doing it. Of course, letting them know that it may have side effects that are on top of the chemotherapy, such as hot flashes or vaginal dryness or changes in mood. Any thoughts? Uh, I totally agree. I, I um, tend to recommend um, elytrage agonist with chemotherapy in patients 40 and under because the chemotherapy may not suppress ovarian function. And then you're going to be waiting months before you start the most important therapy of all, which is endocrine therapy. In older women, they get the dual effect of chemo of any, um, you know, killing of microscopic cells that are able to die, but they're also getting ovarian function suppression. So I, um, and the text trial thankfully showed, you know, that it was absolutely safe uh, to do that. So I certainly would do it for somebody interested in fertility, but I, I do it for, to, treat, to treat the breast cancer too. Um, although, being clear, when the soft and the text approaches, because it's in soft, you had to recover your ovarian function, then you were randomized to um, tamoxifen versus tamoxifen with the LHRH agonist versus AI plus LHRH agonist. And so there was a delay. You had to, be, you had to recover within eight months of finishing your, um, your adjuvant chemotherapy if you had that. So there was a delay in the um, endocrine therapy, but um, starting the LHRH agonist early, like was done in the text, they really, they could not say that that was beneficial for your breast cancer outcome. It's complicated though, because it's very difficult to start slicing and dicing by age and all the other, um, you know, patient and tumor characteristics. Do you ever, I think it was Dr. Sharma alluded to, quote, easing a patient into this you know, that you're concerned that they're going to, you know, have, you know, immediate men a menopause and a, a lot of symptoms and want to go off therapy. Do you ever, like, start out with tamoxifen and, or AI and then bring in? Uh, or obviously, you can't do that with an AI, but do you ever start out with a little lesser therapy and let them get used to it? Yes, um, I'm a, a big believer that we really need to be using um, an, uh, an aromatase inhibitor in patients with very virulent disease. There is a, that lovely... Um, 
online algorithm from the Dana-Farber with the step analysis from the soft and the text trials, looking at six or seven really good parameters that tell us what's the risk of these patients and how much benefit they get from an AI versus tamoxifen and with an LHRH agonist. So the more they have the risk factors, the bigger the delta on the benefit from the AI. So I don't start with tamoxifen in those patients, but if I have someone with lower risk, I definitely do. Great. Okay, Hal, let's talk about some data. Okay. Uh, let's see. So I was uh, asked to speak about ovarian function suppression, and there are really three reasons we use ovarian function suppression in early stage breast cancer. So the first is it is in of itself the therapeutic intervention. It helps prevent cancer recurrence and helps improve overall survival, and especially in higher risk cancers that are ER positive. Secondly, it enables aromatase inhibitor therapy, and as Joyce just alluded to, in the soft analysis uh, paired with text analysis, that improves outcomes. And third, it does have a role in serving as an ovarian protectant during chemotherapy. It's interesting, Neil, you mentioned pembrolizumab in that case, and I think we still need to figure out what the longer-term effects of pembro are going to be. Certainly the unusual endocrinopathies can, I think, contribute to loss of fertility in very young women if they experience those. So a highlight of last year's ASCO meeting presented by Richard Gray, and I heard today that Richard passed away. Is that true? I'm yeah, sorry to hear that. Yeah, that was mentioned sad. at the podium. So um, uh, from the Oxford Overview Group looked uh, at the ovarian function, role of ovarian function suppression. So this was 25 trials, 15,000 patients. It's important to note that there's some limitations here because a lot of these studies were done in an era before the widespread use of tamoxifen. So this is looking at ovarian function suppression as the only intervention. But what you can see is that in patients who are premenopausal, Ovarian function suppression has a dramatic role in lowering the risk of recurrence, and that is most pronounced in the younger women, the women less than 45. Uh, as women get closer to natural menopause, the benefit is still persistent but is less immediately noticeable. They also looked at all-cause and um, breast cancer mortality, and the important point here is your middle panel to make the point that ovarian function suppression does not in any way increase late death in breast cancer patients. There's hypothetical worries about what if you predispose them to Alzheimer's because of premature menopause, or what if you predispose them to heart disease because they don't have estrogens. It doesn't affect their survival at all in a negative way. So non-breast cancer death is a non-issue for patients starting this intervention. Now, what if you look at the women who actually got tamoxifen, what well, we would now consider at least a minimal standard of care, there the benefits become less pronounced, but the, still the hazard ratio is 0.8. It's highly statistically significant with about a 5% uh, reduction in risk through 15 years of follow-up in younger women. So who really benefits? Well, one question has been, what's the role of chemotherapy? We've already alluded to this a couple times. And what they showed here is that if you just gave chemotherapy and then the women also got ovarian function suppression, you'll see that the, like, the benefit of ovarian function suppression decreases as the women get closer to age 50. This was actually beautifully just shown by Matt in his reports on the Taylor X trial. The only explanation for this that I can imagine is that you're less likely to go into menopause with chemotherapy, and as you get closer to natural menopause at age 50, 55, the likelihood of chemotherapy-induced amenorrhea goes up, and so the benefit of ovarian function suppression goes down. In the Taylor X study, you'll notice that actually the very young women do not benefit from chemotherapy. Less than 40, there's no benefit. It goes up from 40 to 45, up again from 45 to 50, and in the rare women who are post uh, premenopausal at 50, again, there's no benefit. The only conceivable explanation for that is that it's inducing ovarian function suppression. If you actually remain premenopausal, or if you don't get chemo, ovarian function suppression has an incredibly consistent hazard ratio across the age spectrum. So it's the interaction between chemo and ovarian function that's so important here. So we know that ovarian function suppression plus tamoxifen lowers the risk of occurrence. Uh, these are data from soft and text looking at the question of whether it's better to give an aromatase inhibitor or not. The takeaway here is it's exactly like the ATAC study. If you do a really large trial in a relatively moderate to high risk patient group, you see that there is a benefit for AIs over tamoxifen in postmenopausal women, which is what they are once you initiate ovarian function suppression. So these are the long-term data now for soft and text. And I think this is the figure Joyce was just alluding to, which is that if you look at the step analysis and you factor in all the varieties of different clinical factors, you can see that pretty consistently using examestane in this case over tamoxifen paired with ovarian function suppression yields the best results.
And that was true most particularly in younger women, and as you get older, actually, the benefits get a little narrower. So caveat point here is that in that patient who doesn't want to deal with ovarian function suppression and therefore you're giving her chemotherapy, you're not getting your best effect unless you also give her ovarian function suppression if she's still menstruating. That is to say, chemotherapy is not a way to escape the necessity for ovarian function suppression. Okay, so there have been confirmatory studies in more recent years. This was one presented here a couple of years ago, the ASTRA study, which was a Korean-led group that looked at two years of ovarian function suppression and tamoxifen or tamoxifen alone. Very consistent results with the uh, soft data showing that adding ovarian function suppression reduces the risk of recurrence. We are frequently asked what's the best way to give ovarian function suppression. In the clinical trials, it was given monthly. In clinical practice, I usually give it every three months. We don't know which is best. There was an interesting study presented at ASCO from actually a Brazilian group, and it looked at whether women had detectable estrogen levels. That was measured in the orange bars here. And interestingly, monthly GnRH was less likely to achieve full ovarian function suppression than every three months, not because it's inherently but different, it's just because patients don't show up every month for their treatments. So so I just give it every three months, and 97% uh, of the time that works quite effectively. So what about this issue of ovarian suppression as a way to preserve fertility? It's been studied in at least three randomized trials. The endpoints varied a little bit, the percent of women who remained premenopausal at one year or five years. But with remarkable consistency, it's been shown that adding GnRH agonist uh, at the time of initiation of chemotherapy does um, reduce the, uh, it does improve the likelihood of maintaining menstruation, and in some of these trials, it actually increases the risk, uh, the, the likelihood, excuse me, not the risk. <laughs> if you have too many children, it's the risk, but otherwise, it's the <laughs> likelihood of having a baby uh, uh, when you do this strategy. And we also start the GnRH agonist before the chemotherapy, as in like about 15 minutes before the chemotherapy bag is hung in the clinic, we give them the GnRH <laughs> agonist treatment. I don't think giving it seven days ahead or anything like that does anything magical, but I have no data on that. Uh, and the final uh, issue I was asked to speak to as it relates to fertility was the safety of pregnancy after breast cancer. This has been a question that's been asked at this meeting and at many others over the recent decades. And a large number of retrospective analyses have shown that there is no detrimental effect for women who become pregnant after breast cancer. Now, these are retrospective analyses, and in fact, they've shown in many instances that the women who become pregnant after breast cancer have a lower risk of recurrence. And the Ex, uh, you know, the accepted explanation for this is what they call the healthy mother effect, that there's an inherent bias that the women who are choosing to become pregnant have either been advised or have internalized a message that their risk is somehow sufficiently lower that they can safely proceed to pregnancy. Um, in the more, slightly more modern era, this has been looked at in many retrospective analyses. And again, women who become pregnant compared to case match controls for either ER positive or ER negative cancer, there's never been seen a detrimental signal to becoming pregnant. And in the perhaps uh, one of the nicest analyses, uh, again, the same idea, uh, cohort match studies uh, <coughs> really showing that um, there was no downside. Now, the caveat here is that many of these women had ER negative disease, or many of them had finished, as in this case, four to five years of endocrine therapy already. So my colleague uh, Ann Partridge led uh, probably what will be the only prospective study of this question, the positive study, which she presented earlier this year and published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this was a study that, in a registry fashion, asked, uh, offered to women who were seeking to become pregnant the opportunity to stop therapy with tamoxifen or tamoxifen and ovarian function suppression, conceive the child, bear the child, and then presumably resume adjuvant endocrine therapy. And they used a matched cohort from the SOFT trial to sort of benchmark the risk of recurrence. And what they showed, and these are the Kaplan-Meier analyses, is that compared to the case control cohort, there was no risk uh, of greater recurrence for women who interrupted endocrine therapy for a year during their five years of treatment uh, to become pregnant. In fact, many of them went on to have very successful pregnancies. Now, of course, for the patients, you do need to remind them that stage still matters. The risk of recurrence in the cohort <coughs> for women who had stage three breast cancer was actually around 20% in the three to four years after entering the study. So stage still matters a lot, um, but there's no increased risk for the patient who was willing to uh, consider pregnancy. So finally, we were asked to speak about the duration of treatment, and I just show a vote that we took at the St. Gallen Conference in March of 20, 2023 in Vienna, where we asked about 100 leading cancer experts about the optimal duration of endocrine therapy, 
And the answers were here shown as follows. For women who had stage one tumors, that is to say no negative, two centimeters or less, most were recommending two years of treatment. For women who had stage two, no negative, it was between seven and eight years or five years. For women who had stage two, no positive disease, we were stretching, the vote was to stretch the recommended duration towards seven or eight years based on Michael Ganant's ABCSG data showing that that was as good as 10 years. And for women who had stage three, we usually uh, recommended a full 10 years of treatment. I actually think that uh, we all can imagine individual patients where it might vary from patient to patient, but in the broad measure, I think that seems like a pretty rational approach. So um, with that, I think we've covered uh, the assigned topics. Thanks a lot, Hal. We're going to move on in a second, but we've got a lot of great uh, cases here. So uh, <clears throat> Laosha, 40, this is interesting, 48-year-old postmenopausal woman with a 9 centimeter, grade 2, ILC, 0 of 2 sentinel lymph nodes, recurrence score 23. R.S. Clin predicts 7% benefit of chemo. Any thoughts? Um, <clears throat> I thought so, I'd give you an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> so if the R.S. Clin predicts a 7% improvement in, by using uh, chemotherapy, I would probably follow that because that's an objective metric that's based on uh, sort of integrating the risk um, fact risk variables together. So I understand, so obviously, the, the size of the lesion really puts her at very high risk. The ILC histology would probably put her into the group that we would think chemotherapy wouldn't work, but we only think that. So, <clears throat> of course, I mean, the greater the uncertainty about what's the right answer, the more important it is to listen to the patient. So, so I think I would definitely bring up the, the, the chemotherapy and I would recommend it. Quick second opinion from Matt. Any uh, thoughts about this case? And in general, do you think differently about uh, infiltrating lobular? You know, same exact numbers, but it's lobular. Yeah, I think this is a really good question. <clears throat> so in general, what we know about in, uh, invasive lobular carcinoma is that if you look at, certainly in the neoadjuvant setting, we see very, very low PCR rates. Um, um, when we look at the Oxford overview, uh, that, you know, sort of ask the question of, is there a benefit of chemotherapy? Uh, and people have looked at this issue of lobular versus ductal, just haven't really seen it. And so <clears throat> I think in this situation, I would do exactly what Lyle said, is I would counsel the patient. Um, the question is, what is the delta uh, of benefit of chemotherapy? Certainly this patient's going to really have a large benefit for uh, <laughs> optimizing endocrine therapy. Um, this patient I heard was postmenopausal, is that yep. right? Yeah. So I think most of us are going to be using an aromatase inhibitor. We're going to certainly be thinking about utilizing uh, a, a zoledronic acid. Uh, and, and I think I couldn't rule out a small uh, benefit of chemotherapy, but I think the main point here I would be counseling this patient is to optimize endocrine therapy. Kind of interesting biology, nine centimeters, but no negative. Our real quick one back to Hal. 44-year-old premenopausal woman, multifocal, almost 15 lesions, but no negative. ERP are positive, goes to mastectomy. They do an oncotype on the three largest lesions, recurrence score 11, 14. Uh, they just mentioned 11 and 14. Uh, any uh, thoughts, Hal? Well, this is where you want to sit down at the tumor board and have a look with your pathologist and say, well, how many of these multifocal things are there and get a sense of the size. Um, but in general, she's had definitive local therapy. She has no negative breast cancer. She has stage one or two disease. And I think given the low score, I would give ovarian function suppression and an aromatase inhibitor. And while we would discuss chemotherapy, I think it's hard to see that there would be a major benefit for chemotherapy here. Okay, we're going to move on now and talk about, I think, one of the most exciting areas in all of oncology, not just breast cancer, the use of CDK inhibitors in the adjuvant setting. Again, I flash back to attack and imagine here we are today talking about not only CDK, but like which CDK. In any event, here's uh, some uh, things from our survey. Uh, so we said, uh, would you generally offer adjuvant CDK to a woman uh, with grade two, three centimeter, ear positive, virtue negative? one positive node, and we see a bunch of people are saying either abema or ribo, others are saying just ribo, and others say n nothing. Uh, and then uh, we change it back to a situation of a patient with grade three 
and now you see a lot more um, CDK, uh, Sarah. Any uh, thoughts about how grade affected whether or not uh, people uh, use CDK? I thought it was kind of interesting flip with just that one changed variable. Yeah, it certainly is interesting, and I think we all use grade in our mind, especially in the absence of a recurrence score. It gives us a sort of feeling of the aggressiveness of the tumor and the chemosensitivity of the tumor. Moreover, grade was a factor in that cohort of patients and enrolled in um, the, uh, the Monarch E clinical trial for patients with one to three positive nodes, if I'm not incorrect. I have to always refer back to the study design to make sure. Sometimes I'm very surprised by a patient I would have assumed would have been eligible and they were not. So um, I think that's why we're seeing that more people are taking up the abemocyclib when they're asked about this patient. So one other a survey I'm curious uh, about, uh, and uh, Matt, I'm curious what your thoughts are about this. So we say, uh, would you, putting aside regulatory issues, would you offer a CDK inhibitor to a patient with a grade two, three centimeter node negative tumor? And you can see people are starting to talk about using CDK, uh, mainly ribo. Um, any thoughts about, you know, one of the things I think is interesting, you know, we're talking about the attack trial it's like the original hormonal strategy of tamoxifen, AI, et cetera. You know, you kind of establish what the hazard rate was, and it might have been established in higher risk patients, but then we would take that hazard rate and apply it to the absolute risk of recurrence to figure out the absolute benefit, and then be able to sit down with a patient. And, you know, tamoxifen not having a lot of sort of life, or, you know, endocrine therapy not having a lot of life-threatening uh, abnormalities, you end up treating people at very low risk. Right? We commonly treat people who are 10% or less with hormonal therapy. And I'm kind of wondering, are we going to head in the same direction in terms of CDK? I don't think we're there yet, but I don't know if you kind of get where I'm heading, Matt. I, I even talked to like other, you know, adjuvant lung topic also. They also do the same kind of thing. You establish the hazard rate with a high risk patients, but again, they don't bring it down to lower risk. Any thoughts? Well, this is exactly the conversation I have with patients in the clinic. Uh, getting back to uh, uh, Sarah's point, you know, in the monarchy, um, in order to get onto the trial, you had to have four or more positive lymph nodes, or one to three with other high-risk features, large tumor, high grade. So this patient clearly would have not have been eligible for that study. Um, uh, this, this patient uh, may have been eligible uh, for the Natalie study. Now, in that trial, you, uh, in that study, you had to have other uh, factors. You know, if you were no negative, have a high-risk genomic assay, that sort of thing. But I think it does get down back to that exact sort of thing you're, 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 you're thinking about, and that is, you know, what is the hazard ratio? Uh, what is the patient's uh, baseline risk for recurrence? And then, you know, you talk about, okay, listen, here's three years of this uh, drug that's going to cost you an arm and a leg, um, and it's going to give you a 3% benefit. And for some of my patients, they say to me, you know what, I want that benefit. And for other patients, they say, are you kidding me? <laughs> so you, it really comes down to not trying to sort of make it, you know, sort of my own values, but to say, listen, this is, <clears throat> you know, this is what we see, this is the benefit, this is what I recommend, but I want to get feedback from the patient. I would say in this particular patient, most of us obviously right now would not give the drug, obviously because of the fact that with Natalie, we're still waiting for the long-term data. We want to be able to see once you stop the drug, is that benefit persist like we see with, uh, with, uh, uh, with in the Monarchy study. And uh, the only thing we can say with Natalie, we just need to wait for those data. I'm anticipating we'll see something similar, but right now we don't have that data. We actually did a poster at the 2019 meeting here in San Antonio of a survey we did of breast cancer investigators and HER2 positive disease. And we just asked them, what numbers do you give to a patient? Not like, what treatment do you give? Like, what numbers? I think most of you, you know, if you have an intelligent pa patient who has a background to understand it, wants to know the number, just tell us what the number are, is. Don't tell us, you know, what you want to do. What number are you going to give to the patient? And again, I wonder if that kind of discussion is really moving into this arena. Let's bring in Dr. Pegram's thoughts, and uh, Sarah, maybe you can comment on what he has to say. The abemocycle data was just updated at ESMO recently, and the data look very robust. The curves are continuing to separate with now, I think, about five years of follow-up data. It's very, very impressive. You know, there was concern that the curves might tend to come back together over time. 
kind of like they did in that Penelope B trial. So there was a lot of worry about that, but the opposite is in fact the case. Natalie is in a position to be practice changing. That was also updated at ESMO and the data still look good. In particular at ESMO, they looked at the lower risk subset, like the lymph node negative subset. And so I'm more optimistic now than ever about the Natalie trial that hopefully it will be robust both in the node positive and the lower risk node negative subsets. The abemocyclob adjuvant trial updated ESMO, they also looked at the fraction of patients. About half the patients had at least one dose level reduction due to toxicity. And about 30%, I think, had two levels dose reduced. So they looked at those subsets in the clinical trial, and it looks like those patients did just as well as the intent to treat population. So that's very reassuring that dose modification, at least for the CDK4-6 inhibitor drug class, is probably safe in terms of the efficacy endpoint. So Sarah, what's your bar? What would you like your bar to be? Uh, and any comments in terms of sort of uh, clues, uh, uh, pearls to get people through therapy? Yeah, I think we're all looking for biomarker data who helps uh, to help us better select patients who can avoid all this extra therapy and who will really benefit from this therapy. One thing I'm really hoping for is data to see uh, uh, that that we're going to be able to replace chemotherapy or anthracycline chemotherapy with the use of a CDK4-6 inhibitor in select patients. So I'd like us to, to be smarter and not just keep adding on therapy to patients, um, you know, given the toxicity. Um, I think a lot of work is underway and, and we're, we're heading in the right dis- direction. Any comments, Sarah, on um, Mark's uh, point about dose reduction? I see this as a a theme throughout oncology and throughout breast cancer. In the breast big session uh, at at ASCO, there was a lot of discussion about that. The idea of, you know, do what you have to do, whether it's supportive care or dose reduction, to keep people in treatment. Is that your philosophy? Absolutely. And patients appear to derive benefit even with these dose reductions. At ESMO, they presented the Monarch... Um, one of the monarchy analyses looking at women who are older, they are more likely to have a dose reductions, but they still appear to have that uh, relative benefit from the use of it. And the Natalie study used a lower dose of ribocyclib, which may ultimately end up accounting for better adherence. We'll have to see as longer term follow up um, is, is uh, pursued. So, Laios, I'd like to hear what you have to say about Dr. Mizell's thoughts about choosing a CDK inhibitor in the adjuvant setting. As of now, I'm still really using a bemocyclib exclusively in the adjuvant setting. I think the ribocyclib data that were presented at ASCO this year were intriguing, but still I think require a little bit more follow-up and probably also an FDA approval for me to feel excited about using that in these patients, particularly with the three years that are involved. And really, you know, at this point, I would say anyone who's node positive that I'm worried about, I'm at least bringing it up as an option. But I'm finding that it's easier and easier to get it covered through insurance. I think one of the things that's nice about an oral therapy is it is something that can be stopped and the side effects reversed. Whereas with chemotherapy, if it's hard to tolerate, but you've you know, just had your infusion, the train is kind of you know, out of the station and it can be hard to regain control of that. For me, it's been diarrhea, neutropenia, and fatigue that have been the primary toxicities. With diarrhea, I found for some patients, Imodium works very well. For others, you sometimes have to dose reduce in order to get them to a place where they're doing better. I've really only been using ribocyclob in the metastatic setting. I think the the challenges there logistically sometimes are the EKGs, although now we're more and more using the home EKG monitoring strategies that make it a little easier for patients. LFT abnormalities are something that I've seen more in my ribocyclob patients, particularly in those who are on a lot of different supplements potentially or on other concomitant medications. So uh, any comments on uh, choice of CDK, even putting aside reimbursement and sort of getting people through therapy? So I agree with Dr. Meisel that I think the, the choice primarily depends on the, the side effects and the anticipation that what sort of side effects would be more difficult for, for an individual. So I think many older patients probably will have issues with diarrhea. But of course, you could mitigate that by starting a, a, an anti-diarrheal agent right at the beginning, at the get-go. On the other hand, I think the, the ribocyclib has this QT prolongation, which could be a potentially disastrous complication if it's combined with other QT prolonging drugs. So that's my, my main concern. Also, of course, with ribocyclib, you have a more intense monitoring. So you need to check the liver functions and, the, uh, and, and uh, probably a more frequent uh, neutropenia. So uh, Joyce, I'd like to hear what you have to say about uh, what Dr. Weiner has to say in terms of using 
uh, adjuvants, uh, CDK, uh, and also this idea of what's your lower bar to offer this to a patient. And I'm going to ask you, for example, if you had a patient at 10% risk of recurrence after you know, the usual therapies that you're going to give, you know, um, would, what number, if any, would you give to a patient about how that might be modified by adding it a CDK? If you could, would you offer it? First, I'd like you to uh, take a look at what Eric says. So you and I are both interested in the way that curve is separating. And one could have been concerned that the opposite would happen and that when the drug was stopped, that the curves would start coming together. And that doesn't look like it's the case. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to stay that way, but it's certainly interesting. And I realize it was a high-risk group of patients, but the difference between the two arms is a pretty sizable difference. It's not insignificant by any means. So my threshold for using Abema has continued to go down. And more than that, I actually find using a Bema easier than I used to find it. Maybe that's because I'm dose reducing a little bit more liberally than I did at first. But I find that even when the first month or two are difficult, that it settles down over time. You know, we're waiting for an approval on Ribo. I assume that one will come through. I think at the moment, I will still predominantly tend to use Abema, but I know that there are others who feel that it's simpler to give Ribo and they may want to do that. Any thoughts? Um, I, I certainly am using Abema Cyclib. I agree with um, uh, Eric for the uh, patients eligible for Monarch E. Um, I am starting to talk to patients about ribocyclib, um, you know, waiting for a little bit more data, but getting them kind of teed up. I must say, though, if I have somebody with a T2 or T3, N0, high-grade breast cancer, that's kind of hitting my uh, risk threshold. Those patients can have 20 30% risk of recurrence, and it can happen quickly, you know, and you don't want to be waiting around with, them, um, uh, with something that could reduce their risk by 30% that we see in the, in the Natalie trial, um, when we could give that to them while we're waiting for additional data. So um, I do think that the time, the time is uh, upon us to think about these high-risk node-negative patients and node-positive patients who weren't eligible for monarchy, who have considerable risk, as you said, after um, the optimal endocrine therapy, chemotherapy for most of these patients, because um, it's, we just, you know, they don't, they have a window and they're at risk for recurrence. So I, I actually think that um, starting to think about the right patients for ribocyclib is, is the right thing to do. All right, let's take a look at some data and uh, Sarah's going to present it. Okay, so uh, some data relating to CDK4-6 inhibitors as well as other novel agents in ER positive disease. So first we'll look at the data that was recently reported at ESMO and today updated, looking at neoadjuvant studies for immune therapy. We know that systemic neoadjuvant therapy yields very low pathologic complete response rates in patients with ER positive disease. That said, higher grade ER positive breast cancers do have a higher chance of responsiveness and um, may be more sensitive to immune therapy, setting the stage for these two studies. The first of which is the Checkmate study, first presented at ESMO and updated this morning by Shereen, uh, Shereen Loy. These are not the updated slides. I'm not that fast at getting uh, slides, even though we all are texting one another uh, for slides during the session. Um, in this study, nivolumab was used in combination with taxane uh, anthracycline-based therapy, patients to be eligible had to have higher risk disease. Um, uh, if they had larger tumors, node negative was allowed, but the vast majority were node positive, and grade three um, uh, was not a requirement, but again, the vast majority of patients did have grade three disease. Pathologic complete response was the first readout. That was what was presented um, at ESMO. 
And you can see in the intent to treat population, the primary endpoint, the past CR, was improved with nivolumab added to uh, chemotherapy. The delta between the two arms was 10.5 months. And if you now break it down by uh, patients, um, whether they have PDL1 positivity um, based on the uh, immune cell being at least 1%, look at that delta, 24% delta. So it's both prognostic having a PDL1 one positive tumors, and it's uh, predictive for benefit from the nivolumab. The other study that Joyce uh, updated today was Keynote 756, looking at pembrolizumab in combination, again, with taxane uh, anthracycline-based therapy. In this study, patients' tumors were centrally confirmed to be ER positive and HER2 negative, and grade 3 was a requirement. Um, and if you uh, look here... Um, Sorry, my. yeah, no, that doesn't. Oh, you, I saw you tried to okay. point her. All right, so the pathologic complete response, again, it was significantly improved with a delta of 8.5 um, uh, between the two treatment arms. Looking at other PCR definitions, you still see an improvement with the use of pembrolizumab. These data are really compelling, in my opinion, because now we're getting to past CR rates that are above 20%. That's not been heard of for ER-positive disease, even though this is higher grade. I think these are very important data. That said, we don't yet have event-free survival from these studies. They're eagerly awaited. There was very nice biomarker data presented this morning by Joyce and Shireen. Um, we don't yet have a perfect marker for who can avoid and, uh, the immune-based therapy. You can see the differences in the size of the studies and the differences in the outcomes. I don't need to reiterate it to you. I think many of us are waiting for the event-free survival, um, and the question's going to be, what type of incremental benefit um, do, does immune checkpoint inhibition add to the use of chemotherapy, uh, CDK4-6 inhibitors, bisphosphonates, uh, extended endocrine therapy for high-risk disease? So these are the questions we're going to have to grapple with. And we have to keep in mind uh, the risk of toxicity, including um, immune-related adverse events with these drugs. Quickly going over the adjuvant CDK4-6 inhibitor data, we've been talking about this, the Monarch E study had strict criteria, as Matt earlier indicated, at least four positive lymph nodes uh, or one to three positive nodes, but had to be grade three or larger than uh, uh, five centimeters or larger. There was a small cohort looking at KI-67, but again, node positive disease only. A BEMA was given uh, two years in this study, and the IDFS benefit in the intent to treat population was sustained, and as Mark indicated in his video, nice continued separation of these curves um, that looks like the separation we see with like tamoxifen and endocrine approaches long term, um, really important uh, reduction in the risk of developing an invasive disease-free survival event. That benefit was seen across various subgroups. And although these curves look overlapping completely, if you look at the number of overall survival events, there were fewer in the abemocyclib arm. And looking at these graphics based on the timing of uh, the analysis, um, if you're looking at patients in the green are alive with metastatic disease, in the blue have died due to breast cancer, and then the gray deaths not related to breast cancer. So looking at abemocyclib and endocrine therapy, in each one of those data shots, the abema arm has fewer um, patients who have metastatic disease or deaths due to breast cancer. It's kind of a fancy way of playing with the data when you don't have a significant uh, survival difference between the arms, but I do think it's a valuable uh, and important way of looking at the data. I think we're impacting patients long term. The Natalie study looked at three years of ribocyclib at a lower dose than is approved for metastatic breast cancer, 400 milligrams daily. Um, and uh, in this study, they allowed patients with node negative disease, a clear difference. This included patients with lower risk disease. Um, and if they had uh, node negative disease and they had grade two, they had to have another feature of high risk, KI-67 oncotype or another genomic panel indicating high risk or N1 disease. Um, and the IDFS was the primary endpoint. 
baseline characteristics were nicely um, uh, balanced uh, between the two treatment arms. I just call out that a more than a quarter of patients had node negative disease. So this really is giving us data in node negative patients like Neil presented earlier. And these are the data presented at uh, ASCO this year, uh, showing an improvement of around 3.3% absolute with a hazard ratio of 0.748 in favor of uh, ribocyclib. The median follow-up was just around 28 months. So as was mentioned earlier, very short follow-up. Um, and we are all interested in seeing whether those two curves continue to separate once patients are off therapy, keeping in mind patients were on therapy three years. These data are being updated here at San Antonio with the final IDFS. Um, I don't, I think it may be tomorrow they're being presented by Gabe. Um, so here is a summary of the two positive adjuvant CDK4-6 inhibitor studies. The sizes of the studies were fairly similar, and the groups were similar with the exception of the risk. In Natalie, um, only 27% of patients had grade 3, 28% were node negative, um, and the discontinuation rates prematurely were fairly similar um, between the two arms. So keep an eye out for the follow-up. And then without going through this, a number of studies have looked at neoadjuvant use of CDK4-6 inhibitors, ribo or abema, or here, palbocyclib, looking at KI-67 change as a biomarker endpoint, as a surrogate for long-term benefit. These aren't practice-changing studies, but did pave the way for these adjuvant studies that were done. And finally, what about the hormone receptor-positive high-risk breast cancer patients who also have a germline BRCA mutation? I I said I would never see one of these patients in the clinic, so why are we spending so much time at these conferences talking about it? And then I had two patients a year ago that I had to deal with. Do I do a Bema or a Laparib? In Olympia, they allowed hormone receptor positive breast cancer patients, but they had to be very high risk. Four or more positive nodes in the adjuvant setting or very high risk um, if they ha in the neoadjuvant setting. This is the overall benefit of a lap rib, including hormone receptor negative and positive together, meeting the IDFS and OS endpoints, practice changing data. If you look at the, <clears throat> the um, forest plot, you can see that in the hormone receptor positive patients um, that had neoadjuvant therapy, you can see that the hazard ratio is right around 0.5. So it should work just as well for patients um, who have uh, hormone receptor positive breast cancer, but the number of patients enrolled in this study with that subtype of disease was small. So in conclusion, high-risk ER-positive breast cancers that are node-positive, we now have a number of options. Sorting through these options is going to take a lot of nuanced decision-making, tumor board discussions, and further data. So when you said, you know, we talk about that scenario all the time, we never see it, then you say, I saw yeah. Hal gave me a yeah. nasty look. <laughs> <Yeah>. I, <laughs> All right, Hal, so let's, you take a look at these, uh, Hal. <laughs> Let me know what you think we're going to talk. Move on now, talk about triple negative breast cancer. There's so much to talk about here. Uh, here's some, some findings from the survey. Uh, so uh, question one uh, would be, uh, based on your experience, uh, should uh, PARP, say a lap rib, be offered to patients with localized breast cancer <laughs> with either a somatic or germline mutation? Any number of positive nodes? Half Half the group says yes. Select patient with node negative tumors. A third of the group says yes. Al? Yeah. I mean, um, I think for most of us, uh, we think the lap is a pretty important <coughs> drug for BRCA1, BRCA2 carriers. You know, the issue here is, is nuanced in two ways. So one is, Neil, when you were alluding earlier to this idea of the proportional risk reduction, like we would say, what's your baseline risk, and then chemo will reduce it by 30%. That was on the assumption that the proportional benefit was uniform for all cancers. It is not. That's what the oncotype test has shown us. Some patients need chemotherapy, a lot of patients do not. So it's not that everybody has a 30% risk reduction. Some get a 50% reduction, most get 0% reduction. The same is true for endocrine therapy. If you look at ER expression. And what we saw today, and um, uh, Sarah alluded to, was that if you actually look at subsets for the benefit of immunotherapy, you're seeing most of it in the tumors that have high TILs, very low ER. The ordinary ER-positive breast cancer, strongly ER-positive, um, lower grade, uh, with less um, TILs, hardly any difference in the PCR rate. So the point is that when you look at a clinical trial, 
Have they enriched for a population that just is at greater risk for an event, or have they enriched for, enriched for a population that's the target population? And many of the studies that Sarah just alluded to, they used the stage and the grade to enrich for a higher risk population, because there is no marker for well, who's going to benefit from a CDK4-6. So then we scratch our chin and say, well, would it work as well in a lower risk? In these cases, we think we're enriching for the right target. I think most of us are inclined to recommend more elaborate. So here are a couple of questions about whether you use uh, PARP in such situations. What about somatic BRCA as opposed to germline? I'm surprised a bunch of people said they haven't, you know, like in uh, ovarian cancer, somatic, same as a germline, at least they treat it that way. Uh, here, PALB2, which I've heard people call PALB3, uh, they will uh, use a laparib in this situation. Um, we asked about triple negative disease and well, whether the, the uh, faculty has combined a PARP inhibitor with an IO, and it looks like either they have or they would. Uh, and then you'll hear about that in uh, the videos as well. And then a duration of adjuvant Pembro, most people uh, going with the 27 weeks. Uh, so Joyce, I'd like to hear what your thoughts are uh, from, uh, about the comments from Dr. Tarantino and Dr. Sharma about Keynote 522. I'm using the exact 522 approach for fit patients, but there are cases which instead there are concerns. I do tend to believe that omitting the anthocyclines and utilizing what has been called the Priyanka Sharma regimen now, because she's conducting great studies in this setting with docetaxel carboplatin with Pembro, I think it's a reasonable approach. We have seen in a single arm phase two neoadjuvant trial that it has comparable PATSIA rate with the Keynote 522 regimen. And now there is a scarlet phase three trial aiming to confirm this, but it's usually depending on this, on the age and the fitness of the patient. If I can, I do prefer utilizing the full Keynote 522 regimen. There is a large national trial that launched in July of this year, which actually I'm leading. It's a SWOG study called SCARLET that is comparing the 522 regimen in early stage triple negative breast cancer to a shorter and less cumbersome chemotherapy Pembro backbone with carboplatin, docetaxel, and pembrolizumab. So six cycles of that versus the 522, which is eight cycles, six months. It's a large non-inferiority trial with survival as an endpoint. Outside of a clinical trial, we've personally done a lot of work with platinum taxane and platinum taxane and pembro. So for my patients with lower risk disease, node negative, triple negative, you know, T2 cancers, I am comfortable in offering platinum taxane and immunotherapy, which is, you know, the front part of 522, right? So if you do that and you have an MRI response with, you know, four or six cycles, you can probably spare them anthracycline and spare them the complexity of the entire regimen. Choice? Totally agree. I, I, I do um, try to de-escalate away from the AC if I can in a uh, T1C, lower T2, lower end of stage two, and give the Priyanka Sharma regimen that's being looked at in Scarlet, because you can always give the AC in the adjuvant setting, although one can argue that's maybe not as good as giving it preoperatively, but you haven't totally burned a bridge for the patient if you find a positive node, for example, that you don't expect. But, but you can also monitor with imaging along the way. Interesting. So uh, we saw a presentation today of the Al 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 Alexandra or Impassion 030 uh, study, which a uh, phase three trial looking at adjuvant IO, atezolizumab, something that you're, you've had a study going on for quite a while, Dr. Puzdai. This study, I think, is the first phase three to report without prior neoadjuvant therapy, right? And was negative. Uh, Dr. Weiner was one of the authors. Uh, here are his, his thoughts about that. I don't think there's been a full-fledged phase three trial with all post-operative immunotherapy. And in fact, when we were designing that trial, one of the debates was whether we could pull it off because neoadjuvant therapy was given so frequently. So the interesting thing is it kind of looks negative from the abstract. I think that that's an accurate description. I think that there are two potential explanations. And one of those explanations is that it just doesn't work if the tumor isn't in place any longer. And 
The other is that it's a drug issue because, of course, the trial that has been positive is with Pembro. We actually had a case that we just presented of a patient who had a small, very small primary. They went to surgery, found a bunch of positive nodes unexpectedly. And of course, the first thing is, can we give them an I.O.? I guess the answer is maybe not, or maybe Pembro. Well, the answer is certainly don't give a Tezo. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, any thoughts about your colleagues' thoughts? So I, I agree with my boss, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so there is um, one other study that, that is still ongoing in terms of the, um, the follow-up time, and it's the SWOGAS 1418 which took <clears throat> triple negative breast cancer patients who had residual disease and randomized them to, to observation or capsidobin, standard of care uh, versus pembrolizumab for one year. And that study actually has fewer events than, than we anticipated. So it has not been reported yet. But, but that will address this question, whether you could actually pick up the slack by doing pembrolizumab after the surgery. Any thoughts about whether, you know, one checkpoint might be different, particularly anti-PD-1 versus PDL one There's an adjuvant Nevo study in bladder that's positive and Atezo is negative. Any thoughts yeah. there? So, I mean, clearly, um, <clears throat> Merck either has an incredibly lucky streak and they should also play the lottery because in almost all settings, their studies t tend to outshine the, the competitors. So there is probably something about pembrolizumab and a PD-1 antagonist as opposed to a PD ligand one antagonist. So, so I uh, think there may be subtle differences between the drugs. We talked a little bit about PARP and ER positive. Joyce is going to talk about an ER negative. Matt, I'll be curious what your thoughts are about Dr. Brofsky's thoughts about PARP inhibitors. Anybody with triple negative disease is going to have germline BRC testing regardless of their age at this point, because it's a biomarker. It's not just screening. If they are positive, they will get a PARP afterwards. The real issue is combining it with IO at that point. And that's a real mystery. A lot of my colleagues will combine it. Personally, I'm not sure. I've had this dilemma happen a couple of times now. And I have stopped. I mean, someone who you know has a lot of residual disease, I've held the IO and just given them PARP, actually where indicated. The other big question is, if someone has a lot of residual disease and ER positive disease, you know, when do you give a BEMA? And I think in that setting, I would give a year apart because of the BEMA, you can give it up to 18 months after. And I'll give the BEMA after a year apart. What about PARP toxicity? Anemia is the big one. I think anemia, you know, I've had a few people get down to seven or six and a half. And, you know, we've talked about transfusion. The other one is nausea. Those are the big ones. One subtle thing, you do a germline BRCA test, and it comes back a variant of unknown significance. Now, those were not allowed in the trials, but I think it's really interesting to kind of figure out what to do with those VUSs, and should you give a PARP or not? The answer right now is no, but to talk to the geneticists about it, it's like, oh, VUS, you don't screen the family. No, this is a biomarker of response to a therapy now, and we really have to kind of push a little harder to adjudicate the VUS or not. People say a lot in 80 seconds. So Matt, <laughs> any thoughts about a lot of things he said? Just a couple of comments. Uh, <clears throat> I think the VUS, of course, is a really big issue. Why? Because, you know, there's no such thing technically as a VUS. So the variation or the variant is truly either pathogenic or it's not. It's just that we don't know. And, you know, um, many of these VUSs are rare. They haven't been studied extensively. <clears throat> we have an investigator at our institution who's been studying this and within our spore, Fergus Couch, who has uh, developed assays, uh, DNA repair assays, uh, to be able to take a VUS, uh, transfect it into a cell, and actually give the cell uh, DNA damage, uh, and then look at a reporter assay. And what he's shown is that using this assay, it's 100% sensitive and 100% uh, specific as it relates to comparing with known pathogenic and known, uh, um, uh, known benign. The issue is, it's a cumbersome assay. No one can do this in real time. His work has already helped to reclassify about 250 um, uh, VUSs 
but we clearly need better ways to do this. I completely agree with Adam in the sense that, you know, it's not just about risk or, you know, gee, uh, um, you know, are my kids at risk, but it's also about, and this is now about a drug. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's, it's taken a little bit of our genetic counselors some time to figure this out. Um, you know, uh, we, we need this information, right? Because it's actually going to affect how we're going to treat. And, and, I, and if I got a drug that's going to reduce the risk for recurrence of, by 50% and prolong survival, I've got to know. So I think this is certainly a, um, uh, an issue. VUS is a thorn in the flesh of those patients that get it because they're like, you know, what do I do? Unfortunately, if it's truly a VUS, we don't give therapies that we don't know what, uh, you know, if that's pathogenic or not. But ideally, you know, as time goes on, we'll be able to sort this out further. So, uh, Hal, I'm curious about your thoughts, but maybe uh, before you do that, you can also uh, respond to uh, Dr. Mizell's thoughts also. I think, you know, counseling patients up front that it is, you know, a marathon, not a sprint seeing patients frequently throughout treatment, and then making sure to monitor for the IO toxicities that are a little bit new to some of the breast cancer oncologists, those of us who you know haven't been using immunotherapy as long as our colleagues in lung cancer, melanoma, et cetera. You know, we have to make sure to be on the lookout for things like thyroid toxicity, but also the skin rashes, the colitis, the pneumonitis, other things that can come up with immunotherapy. So important for us to be educated and to educate our staff so that when patients call in with side effects, we know what to be looking for. How do you approach the patient with localized triple negative disease who, let's say, has a BRCA mutation? Yeah. So I think in those patients, definitely, I feel like just in my heart of hearts, the carboplatin is probably a little bit more important than the anthracycline. So I do start those patients, of course, with the carboplatin, taxane, and pembrolizumab. I actually haven't had a scenario yet where I've had a BRCA positive patient that hasn't had a PCR with Keynote 522 or some modification of it. But if I did, I would feel comfortable giving a PARP inhibitor along with adjuvant Pembro if the opportunity arose. Interesting observation about platinum sensitivity in these patients. How? Uh, so a um, couple things. Uh, one, they looked in the Olympia study at whether you'd receive platinum or not, and the drug was still, Elabra was still effective irrespective of prior platinum therapy. So I, I take the point that it's probably helpful. Um, the second point relates to the issue of the variance of unknown significance. Remember, PARP inhibitors don't target BRCA. They, they, they're targeting loss of function. So actually, because of the historic genetic studies that Fergus and others have done, they actually have a pretty good idea of which are the pathogenic mutations in BRCA1 and 2, more so than I think for most of the other hereditary genes. The, you should, I don't think we should be giving to VUS cases. I mean, there's absolutely no evidence that they need it, and most of them have been characterized and sorted out. And you're looking for truncations and loss of the gene, loss of function. And while that's, it sounds like we're getting a better assay to answer that, the, you would err on the side of not giving. Um, the third point I would just emphasize is as much as I think we're appropriately using Keynote 522, and that you can tell it works, like we're seeing more and more path CRs, there's no question, it is a more toxic regimen. And there was a poster here with about a 10% hospitalization rate, and that jibes with my experience of late uh, between the colitis, the, um, some of the other side effects, the sort of just exhaustion from the regimen. Uh, it's harder to get these drugs in. Patients are getting sicker. So the upside is it, it does work, and now we have event-free survival data. So I think it's important, and Joyce is probably going to speak to that, but it's a tougher regimen. So Joyce, before you start, just back to Sarah. Any comments, though, about the autoimmune toxicity in these localized situ curable situations, any interesting uh, cases you run across, and what do you typically see? I hear a lot about thyroid skin. Yeah, thyroid disorders occur in about a quarter of patients, so you have to be checking a TSH and certainly have to be checking cortisol, especially before patients go to surgery. I've seen really crazy things happen. I had a patient go into acute kidney failure after three doses of Pembro-based therapy um, for triple negative disease and had to stop uh, Pembro-based therapy. And then, I mean, a, a weird, weird case because it turns out her lymph nodes had HER2 positive breast cancer and her breasts had two breast cancers, triple negative and HER2 positive. So it was a bit of a mess <laughs> having to turn her into uh, trastuzumab-based therapy. But um, yeah, I think anything can happen. You have to have your antenna up and you need your clinical support team to have their antennas up because any complaints, just like uh, Jane said, you, you gotta take seriously weird things happen on this. And while it's not in 20 or 30% of patients, it, you don't wanna miss something really important. All right, Joyce, let's talk about some data. Okay, so we've, we've touched on some of these uh, studies, so I'll go um, relatively quickly um, about the Keynote 522. The big uh, update was at ESMO, 
this year, the five-year analysis data, again, stage two, three, triple negative breast cancer, and um, the PAF-CR rate in the, in, in the, um, for the interim analysis that was for the patients that were to be included in the PAF-CR um, final analysis, it was 13.6%. Um, if you look at all 1,100 patients who are on Keno 522, at the end of the day, the delta was 7.5%. It was, and you don't have to look for pdl one positivity or negativity, as you see on the right. It's prognostic, but it does not predict in triple negative breast cancer who is going to benefit from uh, pembrolizumab preoperative and adjuvant uh, pembrolizumab. And the um, most important data are on the right. This is the interim analysis six. And we see that there is a 9% absolute improvement in a five-year um, event-free survival in favor of the pembrolizumab. And that's in spite of the fact that there was a 7.5% um, improvement in PAF-CR rate. So the EFS was outperforming the PAF-CR in this group of patients. Also, we see in the top line on the right, the 81.3%, that it appears that the curve is flattening out. There have been very few recurrences over the last a year or so, which is certainly very, very gratifying. So I think this really represents a very significant advance in the time that we all have been in, in breast cancer work. This is very, very, very important. Um, also, we found out on the right that in patients who did get a PAF-CR, that there was a higher quality PAF-CR, if you will. There was 4% less risk of recurring if you had uh, the PAF-CR with pembrolizumab as opposed to the PAF-CR with just chemotherapy alone. So that was uh, very interesting. And then also importantly, in the patients who did not have a PAF-CR, we see a 10% absolute improvement in event-free survival. Again, it looks like the patients at 62.6, those without the PAF-CR, it looks like it's flattening out, that um, we may have not seen much more in the way of recurrences in those who had uh, pembrolizumab. So the issue is for our PAF-CR patients, we saw how well they're doing, 88, 92% uh, with pembrolizumab. Do they really need adjuvant pembrolizumab? Most of our immune-related adverse events happen with chemotherapy preoperatively, but some happen in the adjuvant setting. So this important trial is now enrolling the optimized PCR. So patients who have a PAF-CR after at least six cycles of preoperative chemotherapy and pembrolizumab, they have a PAF-CR. They're randomized to observation versus finishing up their adjuvant pembrolizumab per Keynote 522, a very important um, question. We've, we've talked about Priyanka Sharma's regimen, just to briefly uh, review. About 120 patients, preoperative carbo, AUC of six, dose of Taxol 75, and then standard dose pembrolizumab. Um, then surgery, uh, this was before Keynote 522, so patients did not receive adjuvant uh, pembrolizumab. And we see in all comers that the darker purple are the PAF-CRs and the lighter purple is RCB 0 and 1. And you can see the, the error bars because you know, we saw about, it was 64.8% PAF-CRs, almost 65% in the Keynote 522 with four chemotherapy agents and pembrolizumab. This is two chemotherapy agents um, and pembrolizumab with 58%. In the node negative population, 65%. Looks a little bit lower, 46% in node positive. That's because these were biopsy proven node positive disease as opposed to clinical node positive in Keynote 522. Important observation here for patients with ER 1 to 10%. The PAF-CR rate of 53% in this three drug regimen really was the same as those patients. Um, with triple negative with the ERPR less than 1% given the error bars. Again, another piece of evidence that we really should be treating these patients with the Keynote 522 regimen. And again, looking at how well patients are doing PDL1 positive with the um, uh, uh, CPS1 or greater, 76% with pembrolizumab. And then patients without PDL1 PDL negative still benefit. Uh, they still get 39%, but less, much less so. It's, it's clearly a uh, prognostic. Very nice data just recently published in JAMA Oncology updating the event-free survival in the top yellow, those who had a PAF-CR, all patients in the black, and those without a PAF-CR in the blue. And you can see, again, these patients getting a PAF-CR with two chemotherapy agents in pembrolizumab doing really very, very well now three years out. And, you know, no suggestion here that those curves are going to deteriorate. So very exciting. And, of course, this has led now to the initiation of the SCARLET trial that, that uh, Priyanka told us about. So this is stage 2-3 TMBC randomizing to the Priyanka Sharma regimen.
uh, versus the Keynote 522 regimen. All patients will receive the adjuvant pembrolizumab. So very, very important to see if we can de-escalate as we have in HER2 positive breast cancer in the preoperative setting. What do we do for those patients with residual disease at this time if they're germline BRCA wild type? We're all familiar with the CREATEX data. All comers up top, residual disease, randomized to six months of uh, capecitabine versus not. And then the triple negative breast cancer patients for the disease-free survival down the bottom right, a really impressive improvement in disease-free survival. And overall survival is also positive in the triple negative breast cancer group. And you can see in the, with the uh, point estimates there that it's um, 0.58 for triple negative, and there's, it's 0.81. So there's a slight trend in ER positive, but it was really the triple negative breast cancer patients that benefited from the Cape Cytobine. So most of us are adding the Cape Cytobine to the adjuvant pembrolizumab in those high-risk patients because they do have such a uh, poor, uh, poor outcome. We've seen the Olympia data, so just a couple of comments on the triple negative group. Most patients in this uh, trial, which I'll show you right here, um, were germline BRCA, and most of them, 80%, were triple negative. They just had to have any residual disease. If they got preoperative uh, chemotherapy, they just had to have residual uh, disease in breast or lymph nodes. And in the adjuvant setting, they had to be T2 or greater or N1 or greater. And they, were, they qualified for the Olympia, which was placebo versus the year of uh, Olaparib. And um, we know that there's a really very nice 8.8% absolute improvement in invasive disease-free survival in favor of the um, Olaparib and a 3.4% absolute improvement in overall survival that's statistically significant. The hazard there, 0.68, a 32% reduction in the risk of, of death. So this is a very important um, agent as we um, are all well aware. Very, if we could just see on the right there, dose reductions in only 25% of patients, discontinuations due to AEs, 9.9%, 5.8% with Olaparib had a transfusion, but 95% of patients received their intended dose of Olaparib. So it was actually really quite, uh, t quite manageable and quite tolerable. We were all thrilled to see no increase in AML, MDS, and again, only 9.9% had um, permanent discontinuation. So really very, very important addition to, um, for this important group of patients. Just to finish up taking a look at what is um, coming here, we have the Ascent 05 trial patients receive preoperative therapy for their triple negative breast cancer and generally with pembrolizumab. And if they have residual disease, they're randomized to our current standard, which is pembrolizumab with capecitabine versus eight cycles of sasituzumab. So very, very important trial. And, then, and that's with pembrolizumab. This is a very interesting trial. It's a single arm trial, 40 patients, triple negative breast cancer with residual disease within 12 months of their last therapy, including neoadjuvant chemotherapy, surgery, um, and any adjuvant therapy they had. So they have 12 months looking for circulating tumor DNA, finding 40 patients with CT DNA and treating them with six cycles of um, sasituzumab with here a tezolizumab, and the main endpoint is clearance of CT DNA. It'd be very, very nice to be able to parse a little bit more, perhaps, who needs more therapy after they finish a standard of care. The tropian breast O3 is very similar to the Ascent O5. I just showed you residual disease, triple negative breast cancer, randomized to down in the green, our standard capecitabine pembrolizumab, versus eight cycles of datopotumab without checkpoint inhibitor, versus datopotumab with dervalumab. A asking two questions here, is derva better than our current standard and derva, uh, dervalumab better? And then does the dervalumab really add in the adjuvant uh, setting in these patients? So very, very, another very important uh, trial. And then this is the um, tropian breast 04 trial. Hasn't started uh, yet, but soon to start with preoperative keynote 522 regimen <coughs> versus eight cycles of datopotumab with dervalumab. So just a single cytotoxic agent, datopotumab with dervalumab versus keno 522. If patients don't have a PAF-CR, physicians can give them additional chemotherapy in the adjuvant setting along with continued um, uh, dervalumab. So that's, that's where we're going. Awesome. So we're going to finish out talking about circulating uh, tumor DNA. Quick question there from the audience and how I'll actually show you. This is really <laughs> 45-year-old woman with two lesions, uh, both around two and a half centimeters. One is HER2 positive, one is triple negative. Any thoughts about your neoadjuvant approach? <laughs> They're saying, what about uh, anti-HERS plus PEMBRO? 
They do that in upper GI cancers. That's yeah, so just this to prove. Is the, uh, this is the case that Sarah just described, yep. uh, in the sense that it's triple negative intertubules. I mean, I would give a taxane and carbo, because that probably works pretty well in both of these tumors. Uh, it's an interesting question, what you piggyback with it. Um, I would probably go with uh, trastuzumab. I think that that's, you know, a big uh, part of this, uh, if they're equally sized tumors. Um, and, you know, she has a still has a pretty good chance. What was the number in Priyanka's? Uh, well, in the keynote control arm, you got a 50 ish percent chance of PCR with just chemo alone. So, um, are you sure you didn't make that one up? But I, that's what I would do. Probably TCHP. But it was interesting, though. I mean, uh, you know, upper GI can her two positive upper GI cancer, first line therapy or metastatic disease is chemo, trastuzumab, pembro. I can say I wouldn't add an anthracycline in that situation. I would use the Sharma Pembro if I was going to use Pembro because this patient's going to need a full year of HER2 targeted. All right, let's talk about uh, circulating DNA, one of the most uh, uh, discussed topics, I think, of all of oncology. So a couple of uh, questions. Uh, uh, Matt, maybe you can respond. Uh, do you generally administer adjuvant and Pembro to patients with localized uh, triple negative breast cancer, uh, who have a path CR, everybody says yes, that was what was done in the study. But uh, getting back to this issue, Joyce was talking about a good, a good or a better path CR. Um, what about uh, ctDNA in that situation to inform this decision? So the idea of a patient who has a path CR but may be positive, ctDNA, have people done that uh, in this situation? And most people say no, but couple people want, uh, have and another person would think about it. Have you used tumor-informed uh, ctDNA outside a clinical trial in patients with localized breast cancer? And you can see a few people already are doing that. Um, here is what they said. Here are the five pe uh, the people who did it. And what you can take a look at this later in the chat room or uh, in your uh, iPad. We have a lot of content from this uh, survey. But you can see the scenarios where people chose uh, to do it. Uh, interestingly, the top one was neoadjuvant uh, uh, chemo uh, with a negative result and no, no therapy. Uh, so a couple of comments and then uh, we'll look, take a look at some data, uh, starting out uh, with Dr. Weiner. We know that certainly in the triple negative setting, that if a woman has been treated for triple negative breast cancer, and if she is found to have circulating tumor DNA, then she's at very high risk of developing overt metastatic disease. And there's been some suggestion of that in ER positive disease too, from work that Heather Parsons and others have done. The critical thing though, is that we don't wanna to just torture people by letting them know that they're at risk. We wanna be able to intervene. And until we get to a point where we have therapies that we know are gonna be effective in altering the disease course for someone like this who has circulating tumor DNA, I think it's of somewhat limited utility. So the next step is to do studies to try to figure out if we intervene early, will that make a difference? I know that it's already reimbursed in certain instances, but I don't feel like using it yet. But I do feel that we will use it in the future once we have data telling us that escalation or de-escalation based on that can help. Patients that achieve PAT-CR have less than 10% risk of recurrence at five years, but still we can do better at refining prognosis there. CTDNA, of course, it's appealing to you to be utilized there, but in the presence and absence of PAT-CR, I do believe that we in the future, Pembro the adjuvant part of pembrolizumab will not be for all the patients. Now there is the optimized PATCR phase three trial, and that will really tell us what is the benefit of adjuvant and Pembro in the context of PATCR. So Joyce, uh, we have a little in-office pool. Anytime we do a webinar on a solid tumor about how long it's going to take before somebody in the chat room says, what about circulating DNA? <laughs> when average is between 15 and 18 minutes before somebody brings it up because everybody is interested in it. Any thoughts about whether this is going to fit into the breast cancer algorithm? Well, I, you know, I'd be curious to see what Don Lyos uh, thinks, but I think that we don't have to wait necessarily for disease-free and overall survival. We've seen now s so many studies where patients who are ctDNA positive, they have just a, you know, nine months for triple negative and up to two years for 
ER positive, and then they recur. It's very, very predictive that they're going to recur. So if we can clear ctDNA, and there's in, uh, evolving data, more and more data, that if you can clear ctDNA, the patients do much better. So I think these, we're going to be in such a desperate situation. These patients are in a desperate situation. We're going to identify them. Um, I think we have just some... Um, as we're waiting for longer follow-up, I, I have a feeling we're going to go ahead and um, intervene once we have just clearance data. You know, the data with colon cancer is so beautiful. and Everybody adapted it. I mean, you know, you know what you need to do. They set the pattern, but, uh, you know, whether to pull the trigger before you see the data is another question. We do hear a fair number of people using a metastatic disease, stage 4 NED, et cetera, et cetera, unusual situations. Uh, so... Uh, 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 Sarah, why don't you respond uh, to the next two comments? Here's Dr. Pegram. There's a publication using the Natera assay to be particular, which is a bespoke patient individualized CT DNA assay. It's incredible technology, very sensitive, but it's also quantitative. Consequently, Neil, and the big deal about this is the ability theoretically to get rid of many of our restaging CTs which are expensive, radiation exposure, contrast, toxicity, risk, et cetera. Those are very labor intensive and often kind of wasted procedures because many times patients are stable disease or responsive and you're getting all these extra CTs for months on end in some cases, sometimes years, really for no reason. If we knew that the patient's CT DNA was stable or better, we could probably skip many of those CTs. Now, if you have progression, at the ctDNA level quantitatively, I think that needs to be confirmed with CT imaging, obviously. But all those ones in between, I think we can get rid of in the next generation of trials pretty quickly. I don't think we need to wait like long-term like we do in drug development where it may take seven or eight years to develop a new drug. This could happen much more quickly and be practice changing, hopefully. We have the DARE trial open at our institution, which is a trial looking at checking ctDNA in patients with high-risk early-stage ER-positive breast cancer to see if we can detect circulating tumor DNA in patients who are on endocrine therapy. And then if we do, does it make sense to then you know, change their endocrine therapy at that time because they're obviously higher risk for occurrence? I do think that it can be in select metastatic patients a very useful way to sort of monitor disease progress. But I'm a little wary of ordering it in early stage patients without more data demonstrating that it helps us. So Sarah, any thoughts? You know, it's always been fascinating to me, these delayed recurrences that occur with the ER-positive breast cancer. I kind of wonder if we could look at CT DNA, would they, you know, pop up with something a couple years earlier? I guess we don't know. Any thoughts in general? I thought Mark's comment, too, about you know, less imaging was interesting. Any thoughts? Yeah, I like how Mark's thinking about this. He's essentially saying you can use it like a, a better form of the tumor marker so we don't have to use imaging rather than saying intervening at that earlier time point is going to affect long-term outcomes. So I'm with him on that argument. If we can omit the need to do all these recurrent scans, that's great for everyone. Utilizing it in early breast cancer, monitoring it to try and impact long-term outcome by picking up a progression or a recurrence earlier, I'm not on board with yet. I had a patient referred to me who had positive ctDNA, high-risk disease. Her doctor ordered it, and she said, what do I do with this? My doctor doesn't know what to do with this. And I thought, oh, God, you know, this is horrible. Like, in a few, I don't know. <laughs> what do we do with this now, right? And so that's the situation. So hopefully we'll have data in the coming years that, that tells us what whether we can act on it and impart benefit for patients. All right, well, let's take a look at the data that we do have available. Laosh. So I'm glad that this is, uh, I'm the last presenter because this is gonna be um, high expectations and relatively little data. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so just very briefly gonna review a little bit of methods and the optimal source of mater material for detecting cdDNA and rational for doing it. And, and we'll share you some examples of how this technology performs in the new adjuvant setting and in the surveillance post sort of uh, surgery surveillance setting. And I draw your attention to some studies which actually test the clinical utility. And that's really the, the key take home message that we establish the prognostic value of these tests but not their clinical utility. So, so a little bit about the terminology. So cell-free DNA is really sort of free-floating DNA in the plasma, and it could originate from healthy normal tissues, diseased tissues like chip or coronal hematopoiesis, or any inflamed tissues, and of course it could come from cancer as well. So <clears throat> cDNA is a subset of the circulating free DNA that's derived from, 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 from tumors. So it's usually measured as, um, 
um, tumor molecules per ml, or mean tumor molecules per ml, or sometimes as a mutant allele frequency for a single gene. Another word that you oftentimes may hear is, is tumor fraction. So it's really the same thing, but it's expressed as a percent. So ctDNA as a percent of the total cell-free DNA. And it's a nice continuous variable, so there is no positive or negative. So one important point on this slide is the half-life. So ctDNA has a very short half-life, about 30, about 30 minutes to, to two hours. So this really makes it an ideal test to, to follow real-time response or, or, or the appearance of disease. So with regards to the platforms, so you are aware that there are two major platforms, tumor-informed, which require a whole exome sequencing of the cancer to identify the genomic abnormalities that you then try to detect in the blood. So it's a truly personalized assay. Or the tumor agnostic assays, which just go after the usual suspect, the few hundred oncogenes that are frequently mutated. The sensitivity of this, so the, the currently available platforms is about, you need about 50 nanogram of DNA. It's a remarkably small amount. And you can pick up about half a percent of alleles, abnormal alleles. So the, the rationale is pretty straightforward, right? I mean, always wondered why drugs that eliminate micrometastatic disease never eliminate or cure metastatic disease. And probably part of the answer lies in the tumor heterogeneity and the large molecular heterogeneity that large cancers have. So to, to be detectable on a CAT scan, you have about a half a centimeter lesion. That's about a billion cells. So the idea is that if you pick them early, it's a small army, less diverse, and therefore intervening with a treatment might just eradicate them. So like a second line adjuvant therapy. So what does the data show? This is the, um, an example from the, the new adjuvant CTDNA dynamics from the iSPY study, so that's busy. But what I want to point out to you that iSPY, a new adjuvant trial, collected CTDNA at four time points before treatment, at week three, week 12, and at week 20 before surgery, so at the end of the chemotherapy. So you see right away that at the beginning, your CTDNA positivity at the time of diagnosis depends on the size of the tumor, larger tumor, more likely to be positive, and the type. So triple negative disease, HER2 positive disease, more likely to be CTDNA positive. It's also high risk, genomic high risk, cancers tend to be higher. Um, positivity rates. But what's really remarkable, though, is the dynamics. So some people clear their CTDNA after three weeks of weekly taxol plus an investigator and an agent. And if that's the case, then they almost certainly end up with pathological CR. Um, those who did not um, <coughs> um, clear their DNA, by, some of them will continue to clear it by the time they get to the, the second time point or by the time they finish their entire treatment. And that's what this last bar graph shows, that how the cDNA positivity, the red bar, decreases with each of the time points. But the most remarkable thing, actually, is the Kaplan-Meier survival curve. So if you have a PCR, then actually there are no cDNA in PCR patients, so that's not going to be helpful to decide who should continue and Pembro who shouldn't, okay. because the PCR patients don't have cDNA. But those who actually have residual disease and have cDNA, they do really badly, but if they don't, they actually do remarkably well. So this has also been shown by another really elegant study that was presented this morning from our colleagues at Toronto. But basically, this is to summarize this for you. So CDDN negative residual disease has a better prognosis than CDDN positive residual disease. So that's just <clears throat> sort of a, another study in the same new adjuvant followed by adjuvant um, space. And this is a, a swimmer's plot. So each line is a patient. A black dot is a positive result. Uh, um, uh, um, white dot is, is, is CDDN clearance. So you see that in triple negative disease, CDDN is actually very accurate. So if you turn into CDDN negative status, then you don't recur. And if you turn CDNA positive again during follow-up, you, you do recur. But this is less accurate in the setting of an HR or a hormone receptor positive disease. So there, there are cases that recur without being CDNA positive, and some CDNA positive patients just keep on going without any clinical recurrence or even revert spontaneously, maybe about 30% of the time. So that's, again, the, the Kaplan-Meier survivor curse. Let's point out to you that if you turn CDNA positive, Sometime during your follow-up, your prognosis is also very guarded. If you are CDN positive any time during the follow-up, that's sort of a bad prognostic indicator. Um, <clears throat> so this is um, surveillance after surgery in the early stage setting. So that's the ABLIS study. And again, it shows you that you see the dead black dots kind of scattered around during the follow-up period. So you can turn CDN positive any time. And when you do turn CDNA positive, you unfortunately relapse. Um, 30 out of 34 patients actually recurred. So that, that equates to almost 90% sensitivity. 
So the bottom line is that the analytical clinical validity is well established, but the clinical utility is not. So <clears throat> the city predates by eight to 10 months the recurrence clinically, but if we intervene, do we actually help the patients or not? And that's the big unanswered question. So these are the clinical trials that currently test this. A couple of them are in the US, four of them, and the rest of them are outside of the, 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 uh, the US. I really would encourage you to, <clears throat> to support these trials and put patients on it. I'm gonna show you the design of, of our study, the DARE study. So that's um, as a screening phase, if you don't see any positive, you undergo imaging. So we showed the data this morning that, that CTDNA positive patients who are ER positive, about 80% or 70% of the time, they remain imaging negative. So they are really molecular relapse as opposed to a clinical relapse just happens to be asymptomatic. That may be different in triple negative disease. So there is some, some data that suggests that in triple negative disease, by the time you turn CDNA positive, you may already have metastasis, just asymptomatic. <clears throat> this, we also learned from this big effort this, that we accrued about 540 patients. We generated tests on about 470. This 470 test actually 420 or so worked and yielded the CDNA results. Sometimes the assay didn't work because of insufficient tissues. But out of these 1,000 or so tests that we did, only 37 were CDNA positive. In other words, about 8% or 9% of the patients are CTDNA positive, and about 3% of the assays are CTDNA positive. So that's a pretty substantial screening undertaking um, um, as far as it concerned to, to collect patients for randomization. So in the DARE, we so far randomized 22 patients, but the goal is to, to accrue 100 patients. And that's one of the few studies which compare in randomized setting that continuing what you are on versus switching over to a first-line regimen, full vestrant and pulbocyclic because Pfizer supported study um, <clears throat> would improve or even delay the recurrence. So this is the, the, the uh, caveats that you also need to be aware of. So there are costs with liquid biopsies, there is anxiety that to generate, and false positive results could actually lead to, 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 to test uh, treatment for those who don't need it. But false positive <coughs> results are not that common. And of course, treating asymptomatic patients will never improve their, uh, their quality of life. It can only decrease it. And that's the reason why it's really important to know whether this improves the, the outcome. So the conclusion, really, the last piece is what I would normally leave you with, that, that these are, there are clinical trials which actually address the clinical utilities. So if you have patients who turn CTN positive, please refer them to these trials. And one last thing that I didn't put on the slides, and we very rarely talk about it. So every year, about 48,000 women die from breast cancer. So what do you think, what's the stage that they were diagnosed with? So 66% of these patients are diagnosed with stage one and stage two disease. And exactly 24% of all annual breast cancer deaths is from stage one disease. So just think about this. So this is probably one of the ways to, to sort of improve breast cancer mortality if the strategy works by following patients with CTDNA. That was really fascinating. Just a quick follow-up question. Any efforts uh, to try to sort of increase uh, the uh, outcome from liquid biopsy, you know, uh, some more sensitive techniques, the techniques to get the cells uh, to shed more, anything to increase the positivity rate. So, so, so one way to increase the positivity rate is indeed to actually have a better test. So right now, Signatera and the radar assay actually kind of dominate the market, and, and they may not be ultimately the most sensitive methods. But of course, these companies are also working on, on improving their sensitivity. So that's probably one way, and the other way is to, <clears throat> to really sort of cast a very wide net or cast a narrow net for a very high-risk population. But remember, in the monarchy trial, about 16, 17% of patients recurred, but they recurred over three years. Fascinating. So I want to thank the faculty. Thank you for attending. Thanks to the Zoom people. Come on back tomorrow night. We're going to be talking about HER2 low breast cancer.